If you're watching this, you've watched the previous video where we gave you a whole bunch of potential questions that you could be asked in a sysadmin, sysengineer interview. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about some of the potential answers that you can give. Now, before I even get started, I just wanna let you know, I always recommend that you go and do your own research on all of these because that is the best way to pass and do really well in an interview. It's really good that you'll know the answers, but if you've gone and you've built and you've studied and you've learned the stuff yourself, then if you get thrown a question that you're a little bit unfamiliar with or a little bit uncomfortable with, you're more confident to be able to answer it because you've actually got some experience to help you. So we started off by really giving you some behavioral types of questions. Tell me about yourself. Of course, you're gonna just tell about yourself who you are, what you've done, your history, your past work experiences. Perhaps you can talk about some of your personal aspirations, what you do in your own spare time. People like to know what you do outside of work. Why are you leaving your job? Well, be honest, let them know why you are leaving your job. Perhaps it's because you're not getting the experience, you're not getting the exposure, there's some restructuring, whatever it may be, be honest and talk about that. So do you know about the company? Do you know about the role that you're applying for? Don't go in blind, do your research, go to the website of the company that you are hiring against, know what they do, know their core values, know what their strategy is, know the position description or the PD for the role that you're applying for, specifically the technologies that they're looking for and the sort of person that they're looking for. What are some of the top qualities? Well, this is not necessarily technical, but perhaps you're a good communicator, perhaps you're a good negotiator, perhaps you're good You've got very good written and verbal skills. Talk about stuff that you are good at, that you can bring to the role and bring to the company. How do you manage all your priorities and tasks? Well, that's completely up to you. Every single person is different. Some people like to have a calendar. Some people like to have a to-do list. Some people like to be able to track all of their stuff via a ticketing system, via an email, via an Excel spreadsheet where they've got all their task lists, they've got their priorities, the dates, uh, have they done it? Yes, no, it's in progress, all of that sort of stuff. It'll all be dependent on the individual. So make this question or something similar to this personal about what you do to try to help you work better. Where do you see yourself in the next five, 10 years? Have a goal, have a plan. Don't just say, well, I see myself doing the same job right here. A good answer would be, I'd like to see myself having your job in five years, that's a good one. Um, it shows that you are aspiring to become something better, you're wanting to grow in your career. What are your top three technical skills? What are your top three skills that you're not so good at? Be honest, what are you comfortable in? Are you good at servers? Are you good at networking? Are you good at cloud? Mention the stuff that you are confident and comfortable with. Mention some of the skills that you're not as comfortable with, but you are working towards getting better at them. A tricky question, of course, if you're thrown into a scenario where you don't know how to fix the stuff, well, show, this is a question that I want you to show me, uh, what would you do in that scenario? Well, you wanna go and work with other people. You may wanna go onto forums, you go online, you may have some vendors that you can liaise with, that you can talk to, you can consult with other people. You've got contacts on LinkedIn, you could liaise with them. I don't want to know, I don't have to necessarily have to have you resolve the issue right away, but I wanna see that you have got a good understanding about what steps you could be putting in place to try to do that yourself and fix it by liaising, doing your own research, studying it up yourself. So what is DNS? What's it used for? What are the records? Well, of course, DNS, the point of DNS is to translate a IP address to a host name. 192.168.0.3 equals server 01 underscore production, right? DNS server will do that. Its purpose is to translate these things back and forth. You've got a DNS server where all this information is stored in there. So when a computer tries to communicate to a website, when a computer tries to communicate to a server, it goes to the DNS server and it knows exactly where to go because it's translating the IP address or the host name into the IP address or the host name or vice versa. Then you've got different sorts of DNS record types. You've got A name records, you've got C name records, you've got PTR records. There are different record types for different scenarios. So learn these DNS record types. How do computers on a network get an IP address? Well, via DHCP. There's a DHCP server, there's a DHCP service enabled on a router somewhere. 
that server, that router, whatever it may be, has essentially a zone set up with DNS IP addresses. That service essentially has a range of IP addresses that are allocated, that are assigned, and it pushes these out to computers on the network that need an IP. Computer on the network is plugged into a cable, for example, or over the Wi-Fi. It then goes, hey, I need an IP address. It goes and queries the DHCP server. The DHCP server says, cool, here you go. Here's an IP address. So two devices, two servers are having connectivity issues. Well, I wanna know really what you're gonna do. You're gonna open up a command prompt. You're gonna run some ping commands, some trace route commands, some NS lookups. You're gonna make sure that there's communication between the two. Are they physical servers? Are they virtual? If they're physical, well, is there a network cable issue? Are the cables broken? Is there an issue on the network card? Is there an IP conflict somewhere on the network? Well, if it's a physical server, the server cable goes to a patch panel. It goes to a switch. Is there an issue on the patch panel? Is there an issue on the switch? Is there an issue where the two servers are on different VLANs? They're on different subnets. Perhaps there's no route in between these two. Perhaps there's a firewall in the middle blocking traffic, blocking ports between them. There's a bit more that you can cover, but a good overview around that will give, will give you a good head start. Talking a little bit about server patching. Well, have you used WSUS? Have you used SCCM? Talk about, well, you've got test servers, you've got staging servers, you've got development servers, you've got production servers, you've got desktops and laptops. They all need Windows patching. Microsoft release patches every second Tuesday. Those patches need to be deployed against computers and you use something like WSUS, for example, to manage that entire process. All the computers are registering into there, the servers are regist registering into there. The WSUS server gets all of the patches from the internet. You then allocate specific patches, you know, specific updates to those computers. You push them out. You push them out out of hours. You require restarts at times. You let the business know that there's going to be outages, all of that. There's a lot of process stuff around that, but having a good understanding around all of that is actually really, really helpful. We then move into Active Directory and what is AD? Well, AD, of course, is your hierarchy. All of your computers, your users, your servers are managed in there. Create accounts, you can create users, you can reset passwords, you can create security groups, you can assign permissions, all of that. A file server can be allocated a permission that has been defined within Active Directory. You've then got your domain. Of course, that's where all your computers are being bound to. It's your central location. You've then got a forest, which sits above a domain. All of your domains are within a central forest. So forest, one domain, multiple domains, all within a forest. Then you've got a domain admin. Is it the full administrator for a domain? An enterprise admin is the full administrator for the forest and every domain that is sitting underneath it. What about a domain trust? Well, a domain trust, you've got two domains, one company, a second company. Company A goes, hey, I wanna go and buy company B. Company B now says, cool, we now wanna merge our networks together. So you can create what's called a domain trust between two different domains so you can share domain information. You can maybe use a login account from this domain to now log into the domain on the other network, for example. You've got one-way trust, you've got two-way trust, and there's a lot more to it than that, but that's it in a nutshell. We're then talking about group policies. Of course, the group policies is something that is defined on a domain controller. When you configure a domain controller, you get the group policies in there, and group policies let you manage your fleet of Windows systems very, very easily. You can apply the same wallpaper across every computer on your network. You can have all of your computers to have a strong password. So the user has to have a minimum of eight characters. It's a strong password, uppercase, lowercase, all of that sort of stuff. We talked about patching before. Well, you can create a group policy to let all your computers know to now communicate to the WSUS server to get their patches as opposed to the computers going out to the Windows Update server out on the internet. We then moved into virtualization and we specifically focus on VMware. So of course, VMware is one of three major vendors. There's a whole bunch more, but you've also got the Hyper-V, you've got the Citrix, and you've got others, Oracle and others also do similar sorts of virtualization technologies. But the core applications within VMware, historically, generally are gonna be ESXi, which is the hypervisor, the operating system, which is VMware's operating system, which converts a server into a, into a hypervisor, allowing you to build and configure multiple virtual machines within it. You've then got vCenter, which manages multiple ESXi hosts. You use a vSphere client 
on a web client to log into those. vMotion, well, you've got migration of VMs. If you wanna move one VM to another host, you've got host A, host B, server A, server B. You've got a VM sitting on here. You can actually move it, migrate it from one host to another. That's really good, that's a standard migration. But sometimes you'll have to power down that VM to let it move over. vMotion lets you do it potentially while the VM is still running. So there is no outages because you're migrating it on the fly. Causes a lot of configuration that needs to happen in the back end. You need to set up VM kernel ports and management ports and all this other stuff on the network side to get vMotion working. DRS just automates that whole process. It automatically will say, hey, look, host A is running out of resources. I wanna now move that VM to host B because host B has got a lot more resources. It could be moving it between storage. DRS just automates that entire process. You set the rules, DRS manages the whole thing and moves things for you. While well, converting a physical to a virtual server, well, how will you do that? Well, there's some VMware software called P2V, physical to virtual, some software, free, you can go and download it. You point it to the physical server. You say, this is my physical server. It'll then go and convert it and you point it to the new ESXi host or to the vCenter host and it'll go and actually convert it, make it into a virtual machine. And VMware is, is endless, right? There's a lot of stuff you can learn. We covered some of the basics right there, but there's a whole bunch more. And if you wanna know, this is just a little plug for one of my online courses. Down below in my description, I've got a full length VMware, advanced VMware training course online, hours worth of content in there that I know that you'll definitely find helpful. So you can check that out and that will put you in a very, very strong position to get better at VMware. We then talk about the cloud. Well, what is the advantage of the cloud? Well, the cloud is great because it's on the cloud, it's been managed, it's outsourced. You don't have to pay for your own stuff in your place. You save on a lot of costs. You have better high availability, better redundancy, all that sort of stuff in the cloud. But of course the negatives, it's sitting on infrastructure that is not yours. You don't have full ownership and full management of all the physical infrastructure. Yes, you have ownership of the VMs and you can configure all of the, you know, all the network, all the virtual stuff in the cloud, but it's not the same as you having it on premise. Now there's a lot more you can talk about that, but that's just a little bit of a high level overview. You've then got all these different sorts of vendors. You've got Amazon, you've got Google, you've got Microsoft. Well, they're all competitors. They all have their pros and their cons. AWS is the biggest, it's the most popular, it's one that's been around for a long time. Microsoft Azure is really, really good. Of course, the Microsoft 365 platform is built on that. So there's an advantage sometimes there with if you're going with Microsoft 365 to actually have an Azure cloud environment. Just be aware that the technologies between AWS and Azure are fairly similar. There'll also be virtual technologies between the two cloud virtual technologies, but they're just gonna be called slightly differently. There's not too many differences between those two. I've worked with both, I like them both. Google, a lot newer, not as commonly used, but it's catching up very, very quickly. We're then looking at storage. What is a SAN? What is a NAS? Well, a SAN is a storage area network. It is block-based. It's used to create a block of data that is defined and set up as a LUN in storage pools as a LUN. It's then presented to servers, to hosts, to be able to host and build potentially virtual machines on them. Then you've got a NAS or a network attached storage. This is file based. This is gonna be used for SMB shares, for KIF shares, for NFS shares, and you are sharing that out the same way that a file server would be set up, right? The main differences between the two block based SAN file based NAS. So how do you get an ESXi host to talk to a SAN? Well, there's a bit of troubleshooting, right? You've got to set them up. They physically have to be connected. You need to set up your SAN, you need to configure it, you need to build your storage pools, you need to build your LANs, you need to build all of that infrastructure first. ESXi hosts, we need to rack your physical servers, you need to install ESXi onto them, get them on the network, all good. They need to be talking to each other on a network perspective. Then you need some physical cables. Now there's a, a range of different things that you can do. You can go directly over ethernet and you can use an iSCSI protocol. You can go over some fiber channel switches and go over a fiber channel. Um, you know, you can have a fiber channel switch and you run a fiber channel cable from the SAN over to the switch and then from the switch over to the actual um, server. The great thing about that is of course that it is a dedicated fiber channel connection. If it's over iSCSI, over an ethernet cable, sometimes that traffic could be shared. You can also of course dedicate that traffic, 
but you're gonna essentially connect it that way. And what you gotta do is you gotta essentially present the LUN on the SAN to the network. You present it to all of your IPs, all of your subnets, or you present it to a specific ESXi host. And you say, hey, ESXi host 192.168.7.7, this is the LUN that I'm giving to you. On the host, you do a little refresh, you then go, ah, oh, cool, there's some iSCSI initiator on that host and it'll detect that LUN that has been presented to it. And then you can scan it, you can add it, and it'll essentially make that LUN on the SAN into a data store on the VMware side. Then what about RAID? Well, we're not gonna talk about all of RAID, but at least understanding a few of them. Of course, RAID takes advantage of multiple disks. You group those disks together to get different sorts of outcomes, different advantages. RAID zero being you grab all these disks together and you make one large disk. So you've got a disk that is a two terabyte and a disk that is a two terabyte. You combine them, you make a big four terabyte drive. RAID one, you've got a two terabyte and a two terabyte. You bring them together, you have only one single two terabyte, but there is now failover. So if one disk fails, you don't lose the other one. You then got a RAID five where you have a pool of disks and you have parity bits. You have a parity bit spread across all of these RAID five disks and you lose a disk you don't lose any data. You've then got RAID 6, you've got RAID 10, you've got other sorts of RAIDs as well. We're then talking about backups. And of course, backups are super, super important. Every single company needs to know backups and needs to have backups in place. So talked about some of your experience around the backup technologies. So the big ones being Veeam, you've got NetBackup, you've got IBM's TSM, you've got Commvault. There are others out there that are specialists in backup technology. So you need to know a little bit about that. You need to understand that backups are done potentially every single day. There are incremental backups generally during the week. There could be ongoing backups that are consistent every single time something is written, it does a backup like a continuous, a CDP backup. You've then got full backups. You've then got monthly backups. You then got annual backups. Backups go off to the cloud, they go off to tape, they go off to disks, they go off to an alternate site. Of course, with the backups, you then need to be able to restore all of that data. So you've got an incremental, an incremental of course only backs up the changes to the files. You've then got a differential, backs up the changes since the last full backup, and then a full backup does a backup of everything. We then covered a little bit around networking and specifically knowing some of the basic network terminologies. A router of course allows two networks to communicate to each other. Perhaps those two networks are on different subnets and the router just creates that connection between those two. A switch, or you plug in a whole bunch of devices into that. You've got a firewall which protects you know, all of your connections, all of your internal network, your external network, allows certain traffic in, allows only certain traffic out. You can create ports, you can create ACLs or access control lists to allow certain whitelist, blacklist, certain traffic, certain ports from interfering with your network. And what is QAS? Well, a quality of service. This is of course where you configure something on your network to allow specific traffic more priority than other traffic. So for example, you've got on your network, you've got people accessing files on the internet, you've got people making phone calls. So perhaps the phone call VoIP traffic, that's more important. You can't afford that to go down so that all of your bandwidth is now prioritizing against your voice traffic and then other traffic is given different sorts of levels or different tiers. There's other technologies that of course you also should be across and as I said, you wanna cater this to your interview. So if you're going in for an interview, the company itself has specific technologies. So you wanna be able to answer and be confident in the technologies that that company is actually hiring for. Well, hey, why don't you let me know in the comments what you thought? Maybe there's something that I missed. Maybe there's something that you need some help with. I'm happy to have a chat with you and help you out. Thanks so much. Do what you do on the socials by liking, commenting, subscribing. Click on the face right over there and also on the other videos so that you don't miss out on all things tech. Thanks again. We'll see you next time.